Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for such marvelous, undeserved realities. Christ in power, resurrected as we will be when he comes. That is our hope. And God, you have given us the assurance of your word that it is true and it will most certainly come to pass for those who trust you with their whole hearts. I pray that you would let this be the case today, that we would be those who, as we look into the clear and authoritative word that you have spoken to us through your son, that we would be those who entrust ourselves to you, renew our resolve to believe you and to live transformed lives from the gospel. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, I met a man named Jim outside of a Starbucks. I uh, happened to be there studying, and Jim, <clears throat> being a devout Jehovah's Witness, decided that on his way into the movie theater, he would hand out tracks to people who he passed. And so I happened to be one of those people. He handed me Jehovah's Witness literature and probably was not expecting to get into a conversation about what he was handing me. But typically when that happens, when people knock on our door, when I'm approached by people of uh, pseudo-Christian cults, I, uh, I like to engage them and, and ask questions and draw them out a little bit. And so he handed me what he did, and I asked him, I said, thank you so much. Can, uh, can I ask you a few questions? And he said, sure. So I asked him, how would you say someone's made right with God? How can I, a sinner who's uh, clearly I'm not perfect, how can I be made right with God? And so he proceeded to give an answer and so we got into this conversation and I didn't know he was headed to the movies at the time but he said well you know I'm, I'm headed to meet my family why don't we uh why don't we schedule for another time and we can get together I said that'd be great I would love that and so we exchanged information and uh talked in the in the coming days and and scheduled a time to get together the following weekend and we met at that same Starbucks and I walk in, uh, Bible in hand, and Jim has his adult son and his wife there with him. And by the time I even get to the table, he's bought me breakfast, ordered drinks, and I thought, oh wow. I mean, he had a he even had a a new uh, New World translation of the scriptures for me, which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses use. And I realized, you know. This guy does not know I'm a Christian. I should probably tell him pretty quickly <laughs> that I'm already settled in my convictions. Uh, and so I was up front with him, very thankful for, for his kindness, sweet family. And I told him, I, I just need to let you know that um, I am a Christian. I'm glad that we get to meet, but uh, we're going to differ on some very important uh, matters, things of eternal significance. And I said, if, you, if you'd like, I'd still like to, to talk about those things, though, and, and he was open. So as we opened up the scriptures and, and discussed the differences, uh, typically in those conversations, amongst all the various errors that those people are holding, uh, things having to do with the kingdom and how many people are saved and what Jesus is doing in the world currently and different things. None of that really matters if they don't believe the gospel. Who is Jesus and how is man made right before God? And so I proceeded to talk about those things uh, and the conversation quickly came to the differences that 
we hold about who Jesus is. Is he a mere man, someone who is created and then came into the world to do what he did? Or is he God in the flesh, the only God? And really, the, the issue that ended up arresting the rest of our time was a couple passages from John. We'll be looking at one of them today. John 10, 17 through 18, which is what we'll see for our time. And John 2, 17 and following. And both of those passages stress essentially the same truth, that Jesus raised himself from the dead. Jesus had the authority, the ability, as God, to do what no mere man could do, and that is raise himself back to life after he died. And to Jim's credit, during this first meeting, he didn't try to give a trite answer to those passages, and he said, you know, I'm going to have to sit with these and, and get back to you. I, I don't really know what to do with these. I said, great, let's get together again. And so several weeks went by. We kept in touch. He talked to his religious leadership, and he said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to meet again. So he came back. We met. He brought his family again. There was no breakfast this time. I said, thanks so much for meeting with me again. What do, what do you think about these passages? And he gave an answer. And as we begin discussing these same passages again, not wanting to jump around and move to various things, I wanted to really stay there and hold his feet to the fire. His wife was clearly not very happy with the way the conversation was going because even though she hadn't said very much up to this point in either meeting, you could see the look of frustration on her face as I insisted on what the details of this passage. And she finally interjected and said, look, God resurrected Jesus. He didn't resurrect himself. He wasn't God, and that's just it. And before I could even provide a response, again, to Jim's credit, he looked at his wife and said, yeah, but that's not what the passage says. And so he recognized the position that he was in, holding the beliefs that he did, when it came into contact with what the scriptures actually said. These passages where Jesus so clearly attests to his own authority over death and life have no good answer unless Jesus is God in the flesh. And so this morning, as we look at John 10, this will hopefully strengthen our understanding in who Jesus is and in the certainty of what he actually accomplished on earth. John chapter 10, we'll get a running start at this passage, starting in verse 7 and reading through verse 18. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 8, all who come before me, who came before me, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. 
I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Here Jesus is speaking to a crowd of Jews where some religious leaders are present. He has been insisting that these religious leaders are trying to obtain a righteous standing with God the wrong way on the basis of their own self-righteous efforts and not on the basis of God's righteousness freely given. Jesus is insisting that he is the proper entrance into salvation. There is no other way. And this turns into teaching about who he is and what he came to do. He is God's appointed means of salvation. He is the good shepherd and not a hireling who will abandon his sheep at the first sign of trouble. We read it there in verse 12, that in contrast to the hirelings, who are not owners of the sheep, he's not a hireling. He actually is the shepherd who owns the sheep. If you are a Christian who believes the gospel, if you have turned away from a life of self-rule, of pleasing God by your own efforts, then you are owned by Jesus, and you love it this way. You would have it no other way. What Jesus describes in verses 17 and 18 is that his death and resurrection highlight four divine qualities. Four divine qualities, and these two simple, straightforward, unambiguous, verses highlight four divine qualities. The first is this, the Father's love. The Father's love. Jesus' death and resurrection highlight God's unique affection for God the Son. Verse 17 again says, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. There are many reasons why God the Father finds pleasure in God the Son, and he always has. From eternity past, God the Father was delighting in, rejoicing with, marveling at God the Son, and vice versa. This didn't change anything when Jesus came into human flesh to die for sinners and rise again, but... One of the reasons why God the Father loves God the Son here, Jesus says, is specifically because he lays down his life so that he might take it up again. This is further details to what he has already said when he's talked about laying down his life. This is him specifically laying down his life for the sheep, according to verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then again in verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. These are God's people, not just Jews only, but also Gentiles who would be brought into one flock with Jews as the church. These are the ones for whom Jesus lays down his life. And so this love of the Father for the Son 
is unique because the reason the Father loves the Son given by Jesus is also unique. No one else laid down their life for the sheep. Sure, there have been martyrs who for the good of the church, for the sake of God's glory, for the testimony and witness of the church before a watching world, gave their lives, shed their blood, their testimony for Christ resulted in death. But no one gave their life for the sheep like this. No one gave their life as a payment to rescue sheep from the wrath of God. This is unique. And so the love that the Father has for God the Son is a unique love for this unique reason. There is an object, an occasion for this love. The object of that love is Jesus himself. The object of that love is God the Son, Jesus. How often, when you think about what Jesus came to do, Jesus giving his life for sinners, how often when you think about that, do you marvel again that God loves the Father? It is true, as Paul says in Romans 5, that God displayed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's true. God's love is marvelously for us is marvelously displayed in the gospel that Jesus came to die for sinners. But that's not all that the gospel reveals. The gospel reveals not only God's love for us as if what was most on God's mind, what was most on Jesus' mind in coming to die for sinners was love for us. But more than that, God's love for God. The gospel reveals God's love for God. John Murray wrote in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, that the reason for propitiation was God's love for himself. That he was so zealous to defend his own name, he would not let his character be compromised by just sweeping sin under the rug or overlooking sin and not punishing them to the fullest. God so honored himself that he was willing to uphold his character and become the sacrifice for sin, enduring the wrath of God for sinners. That principle is being articulated here by Christ. For this reason, the Father loves the Son because he lays down his life. And that's the occasion for the Father's love. Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection for this specific love from the Father. His laying, di laying down his life in particular. And so Jesus didn't just die to stay dead, as we know, as we've already heard, as the children have already been told this morning. But he died for a further end, and that is to take up his life again, to receive his life again. That's the resurrection. The second divine quality that Jesus' death and resurrection highlight here is the son's willingness. Not only the father's love, but the son's willingness. Verse 18 no one has taken my life away from me. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own, initi on my own initiative. Here Jesus really shows man's own impotence <laughs> and his own initiative. No one could possibly take away Jesus' life from him. How could they? He is the author of life. He is sovereign 
over not just his own life, but all life. He created life. Therefore, his life, whether he had it or not, was dependent only on him. Man was impotent to take away Jesus' life from him against Jesus' will. And so no man, no mere man, possessed the authority or the power to impose their will over Jesus against his life. He did this of his own accord. But I lay it down on my own initiative, or literally from myself. I lay it down from myself. The authority to lay down Jesus' life began and end with Jesus alone and not men. And in this, you see his willingness. If he was going to die, it would only be because he wanted to die. And until he wanted to die, he could not be killed. How often in the Gospels do you see that? Angry mob attempts to throw him over a cliff, and somehow he escapes through the midst of them. They could not kill him until he was ready to die. And then as the events unfold in the latter chapters of the Gospels, you see Jesus in perfect control of the unfolding events against him. Consider what this implies. Jesus was not a helpless victim when he died on the cross. He wanted to die. He intended this. He was the only one who had the ability to ensure his own death, and he did ensure his own death. This is so contrary to what so many are saying in our day about the cross really being Jesus' attempt to show solidarity with oppressed victims. (laughs) Yeah, that's not the purpose of the cross. That's not what was happening in the cross. Jesus was not a victim of the mob. He was not a victim of sinners. Jesus was not at the mercy of the mob. The mob was at the will of Jesus. And Jesus makes this still clearer in the next statement. Again, verse 18, he says, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. The third thing we see here is the son's authority, the father's love, the son's willingness, and also the son's authority. Jesus, the son of God, says here that he has authority over death and he has authority over his life. And again, he's restating what he just said previously, that no one can take his life from him, but he is the one who gives up his own life. And he adds that the basis on which he does this is his own intrinsic authority. No mere man could say such a thing, could make such a claim as this. He has authority over death to lay down his own life. And if that wasn't clear enough, After he has exercised his own authority to give up his own life, after that, he says, and I have authority to take it up again, implying that while he's dead, he's going to exercise his own will over death to obtain life again. Who else can make such a claim? To my knowledge, no one else has even attempted to claim such a thing. Jesus alone makes this claim, and he doesn't fail to deliver. He did that very thing. This this necessarily implies, by the way, If Jesus has this kind of authority to take up his own life post-death, 
if he has that kind of authority, then when he tells you what to do, you ought to obey him. You had better obey him. When Jesus says to repent and believe the gospel, it is incumbent on every single person alive, men and women, boys and girls, adults and children, to obey this command. Children in the room, you must repent and believe the gospel. You are not okay with God just because your parents love Jesus. You are not okay with God just because you are involved in student ministries or may serve in various ways in the church, which we are thankful for. But none of those things make you right with God. And you would be wise not to continue 20 plus years of your life like I did pretending to believe in Jesus and to actually confess your sin before God and admit that you need the salvation that only he offers. The authority that Jesus has over his own life and death, over your life and death, you need him to exercise in your favor to raise you spiritually, to give you a new heart in exchange for the one that you currently have if you do not believe. You need this, and Jesus is willing to give it to all those who repent and believe. Even those of us who profess Christ would be wise this morning to examine ourselves. We come on Sundays, we look polished, we smile, we greet one another warmly. That's great. And as we've heard in equipping hour, as we've experienced recently, none of those things that may be visible on the outside to everyone else ensures sincerity of faith. Let me just ask you, Christian, regardless of how involved you are in, in the activities of Grace Bible Church, regardless of how long you've been at GBC and sat under the sound preaching and teaching and discipleship and the ministry of the word that happens at this church, in the quietness of your own heart, do you pursue holiness there? Do you Profess Christ as Lord, not just with your lips, but even in a passage like, like this one, where Jesus makes his authority so crystal clear, does that resonate with your heart in its own quietness when no one else is around? When you lay your head on your pillow at night, do you still call Jesus Lord? Do you submit to him there as Lord? Do you treat him like he is king? Do you actually embrace his authority over you at the heart level? You must, or else you will miss the kingdom. That is what repentance requires, and that is what Jesus' authority implies. If he has this authority, which he does, which he demonstrated in rising again from the dead, then he has authority over you. You can treat him like it or not. Only those who respect Jesus as king in sincerity will see the kingdom. You can fool men and women. You cannot fool an omniscient God. Jesus does have authority. He proved it with the resurrection. And not only does he have authority, not only is he all-powerful, not only is he the almighty, worthy of all adoration and worship and affection and obedience, but he himself is also obedient. 
And that is the last thing that we see is the son's submission. <laughs> the son's submission. As he articulates his own intrinsic authority, he doesn't leave this out. The last sentence in verse 18, this commandment I received from my father. It's almost jarring to speak of his authority in such clear terms, no, no caveats. He also says that he's obedient as well. The one who possesses all authority also embraces submission. And the two are not antithetical, they are not contradictory or out of place in this same person. There was a commandment, not a request. There was a commandment from the Father. And the Father has commanded Jesus to exercise, exercise his own intrinsic authority in this specific way. Lay down your life for the sheep and then take it up again. This implies that the Father has authority as well, since he's the one giving the commandment to the son about how to exercise the son's own authority. And this commandment that came from the father to the son was met with perfect, humble, obedient submission from the son to the father. There's a play on ideas happening here when Jesus says, I received this commandment from my father. Because the same word translated received, if you're reading the NASB, is the same word, a different form of the same word that he's been using throughout the passage when he's kept saying, lay down, lay down, lay down, I lay down. Or uh, take up, rather. The, the same word that he's taking up his life is the same word received here in verse 18. Just like Jesus would take up his life, he had also taken up this command from the Father, as in to be obeyed. The reason he would take up his life is because he had already chosen to take up the Father's command and obey it. And this is so much like what godly parents require of their children to receive commandments. Just listen to Proverbs 2, 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. That's what good parents require of children. Receive my words. Treasure up my commandments. Well, Jesus was a good son, and he did this very thing. He received God's commands. He took up God's commandments to be obeyed. What an obedient son. Is this what you aim at, Christian? This kind of obedience? It's not too much to ask. It's a fitting response to one with this kind of authority. The one who had the authority to lay down his life and willingly did so for the glory of God on your behalf, for your good. Like Jesus, all who believe in a resurrected Messiah ought to take the same posture to imitate him and receive commandments from God the same way. And that is really the litmus test, is it not? As you celebrate Easter, as you reflect on what Christ has done, examine yourself, ask yourself, do I respond to God this way? Do I strive for this? Do I love to be his slave, to be owned by this good shepherd who laid down his life for me? 
who took up his life again with all authority. I'm going to ask the music team to come back up. If you have questions about this one, if you have questions about who Jesus is, find me. We'll have an elder out at the information table, people in the prayer room after the service who would love to talk to you about how you can know this Lord. God, thank you so much for your word. These wonderful truths by which we experience eternal benefit, God. We would never have any access to if it were not for you telling us these things, for you speaking so clearly, so eagerly to make known your mind to us. Thank you. And God, I pray for this church that you would help us to be genuine, you would make us sincere, that you would purify our hearts, make us know a good conscience, one that worships you in spirit and in truth, that fears you and loves your truth, that boasts in you at the heart level, where no one else but you can see, that we would be true there. And God, we make these bold prayers only on the authority of Christ, only on his name, his reputation, because he is who he is, a fitting savior, a sufficient substitute, and a great resurrected king. We pray, amen.